Hey guys, how's it going? I want to do some more run-throughs, and I want to go through the entirety of the first general epistle of John. And um, <clears throat> so I already did the first chapter, and I'm going to go through chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. This will be on chapter 2. I did an expository on the beginning of chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I wasn't really pleased with how I did it. I was really tired. I stayed up all night finishing that study, and then I recorded it, and I just read from the notes, and I realized I was skipping through the video that I recorded, and I was just looking down at the notes the whole time. So, but yeah, I apologize for things like that. You know, a lot of things need improvement, and uh, I just, you know, I need to get motivated, and everything just needs to be in the right place, you know. But... I'm trying to continue doing stuff and trying to get better. So this run through, I'm just going to read through and share, you know, what I think the verses say, what I think they don't mean, you know, and raise any questions that I have myself. So um, let's see, there's a few different sections here, there's a, like five different sections with this E sword here. Starts off with Christ our advocate. First John chapter two verse one, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Um Okay. So little children you know, I think it would mean his, uh, we're not talking about, you know, children that are aged, you know, two, three, whatever, four. Uh, talking about, you know, uh, kids, adults, anybody who uh, has been led to the Lord. These are like spiritual children. And we see Paul using the same language. Um, These things are right unto you that you sin not. Um, obviously Christians are trying to, uh, you know, refrain from sinning as much as possible and ask for forgiveness when we do. It says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Jesus is our advocate. He's our mediator. This advocate's kind of like a legal term, like our, kind of like our lawyer, our representative. And, um... So, we have the two different persons in the Trinity here, the Father and Jesus, you know, and the people that say that Jesus is the Father is just absurd, so they're saying that the Father is his own advocate, or, or you know, the Father is an advocate between man and himself, or I don't know, I get confused even thinking about that, so I shouldn't even go into that, but it's... It's absurd. There's two distinct persons here. The Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And here he says, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That's an attribute of Jesus. He's righteous, just as God is righteous. Um, so it, it, there could be, you know, some kind of, a kind of a proof of divinity there, because when he says that Jesus is righteous, you know, he's saying he's righteous in the sense that God is, um, you know, perfectly sinless. And, you know, the people who say that Christians can be sinless or Christians need to be sinless to be saved, this verse refutes that, as did ones in the first chapter, and I'm sure there are probably more in this epistle. But, you know, it obviously says that if we do sin, we have an advocate. Um, so, sinning does not disqualify a Christian from salvation. Um, he's a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. And I was looking over this earlier, and I instantly thought about Calvinism. And how this verse directly refutes that. You know, how would they interpret it? I'm going to guess that they say the whole world means Jews and Gentiles. So what they mean is that he is a propitiation for our sins. Um, <clears throat> probably, you know, speaking of John himself and who he's writing to. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of some Gentiles and some Jews. 
no, that's not what it means. And, you know, a lot of people would say that I take a lot of things figuratively and, you know, that they think that I'm trying to twist the scripture because I say a lot of things are figurative, which they are. And even the whole world is figurative in the sense of, you know, Jesus didn't die for the sins of the dirt and, the, you know, the material things that make up earth or the world. It's talking about the people who inhabit the world. It's talking about everybody. Okay. Jesus died for every single individual for their sins. And, um, you know, Calvinists say, well, if he died for the sins of somebody who doesn't repent, for somebody who goes to hell, then the blood of Jesus was wasted. That's not true because it's not, you know, it's, it's not applied to people until they repent. And, um, you know, he had to die for the sins of the whole world. And Calvinism is just silly. And this verse obviously refutes that. Um, so, you know, he died not only for, you know, believers, but for everybody. And um, everybody has the chance to repent. And it doesn't matter if, you know, it's a homosexual or a murderer or a thief, whatever. We're, we're all born into sin. We're all sinners. And so the idea that, you know, homosexual or whatever is a reprobate and can't repent because God uh, doesn't allow them to is ridiculous uh, because Jesus died and he's a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. First John chapter 2, verse 2. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Okay. And uh, this is interesting, something I would like to look into more again. But, um, uh, and I continue on to the next verse. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And a lot of people want to use these uh, verses as a measuring stick for others to determine whether others are saved or not. And I'm not sure that that's exactly how this is to be used. Uh, you know, but, you know, it says, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Um, so there is a thing of, uh, you know, it's definitely something I want to look into more. But there's also, you know, there's the thing of change life here. And a lot of people want to say that you don't have to be, um, you don't have to, a Christian can be saved and, and not have a life change. But here we see that it says those who don't keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So what commandments would they be thinking of then? <laughs> Just just belief or just faith in Jesus. Um, it's definitely part of it, but, you know, I think it's a little bit more than that. It's talking about uh, loving and forgiving, uh, you know, what, you know, the commandments that Jesus said were the most important, you know, love God, love your neighbor, basically. Um, and so there is a difference between the lost and the saved, and the difference isn't just that one is saved and one is lost. There's the change in uh, their beliefs. There's a change in how they live. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know we that are in him. Hereby know we that are. Hereby know we that we are in him. Who keeps his word? Okay. Um, it's the love of God perfected. And, you know, when we say perfected, a lot of times that can mean complete. complete um, and whoso keeps his word. And, you know, there's... Again, the sinless perfection and stuff, they, they want to think that, you know, I'm trying to say that, you know, scriptures does talk about a changed life, but as far as being perfect, you know, keeping his word perfect, like keeping the commandments and not sinning at all or whatever, that's not what this is saying, okay? But 
whoever, you know, um, believes his word, regards it highly, and, you know, tries to live by it, you know, that's what it's talking about. He, that's, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Okay. And then the people who say that there's no changed life, or there doesn't have to be a changed life, they might look at this and say, well, it says ought to. He that saith he abided in him ought himself to walk, but yeah, he doesn't have to. You know, he should, but he doesn't have to. I don't think that's how what this means. I don't think that's what ought means in this context. Um, it really means that, you know, if you're a believer, you're going to walk as Jesus did. Okay. Um, you know, not perfectly as Jesus did, but we're on the same path, you know. The new commandment, and there's quite a bit in this chapter. Um, verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. And so this is interesting because he used uh, that which was in the beginning at the beginning of First John in the first chapter, verse 1. And so what sense does the beginning mean now um, since the commandments were given? Um, since they first heard them? The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. And I've, I didn't go into a lot of detail, I guess, about what different people thought about in the beginning with um, the first chapter when I did my expository. Unfortunately, I think I missed some things, but also I didn't want to cause a lot of confusion. But, you know, I said that I think that it's speaking of the Lord and in the beginning means, you know, before time, eternity passed. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But other people thought, you know, if it's speaking of the evidence of Christ or whatever, that the beginning could be, you know, the beginning of when the gospel was preached, or it could be the beginning, um, you know, I can't even think right now, or the beginning like when Jesus was incarnate. Um, so there's different thoughts of that. You know, when exactly does the beginning mean in this? You know, it doesn't mean from eternity past like it did in the first verse. Um, but I guess when the commandments were given or when these people found out about the commandments, I don't know. Anyways, verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. A new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Okay. Because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Very interesting verse here. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, a new commandment, it's not like he's adding to the commandments of God or something, or he's going above or changing, you know, a new gospel or anything like that. Um, so... You know, and in the verse 7, he says, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old is the word, which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. So he says, I write no new commandment unto you. And then he says, a new commandment I write unto you. Um, which thing is true in him and in you. People might say there's some kind of contradiction there, but there isn't. Um. Maybe he's uh, saying, you know, an old commandment in a new way or something. Uh, but I'd like to look at how to interpret that better. Because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Again, there's kind of a change there if you're, you know... Um, and I, you know, I think this is talking about personal individuals who are saved. In your life, the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. Now, I think uh, a lot of times when we read this, we think that brother means spiritual brother, you know, brother and sister in Christ. But I kind of think that, and I could be wrong, uh, but I think that brother here can also mean... Uh, 
brother man, okay, or brother or sister, woman, whatever, brother man, mankind, uh, everyone, anyone, um, he that saith he's in the light and hates anyone, because Jesus said that, you know, we are to love our enemies, and he said we're to love our neighbors, okay, we're basically to love everybody. And, um, so I don't think that brother is limited to, uh, you know, brother in Christ. It's saying brother, man, anybody, uh, you know, a Christian is not to hate. And so we have, you know, talks about the light and the darkness and I'm sorry, my nose keeps causing me issues. I don't know, <laughs> but, um, you know, Jesus is the light, and we are the light of the world. And Jesus spoke about, you know, the light and the darkness a lot. And the darkness, uh, we have here also, there's a contrast with the light talking about, you know, salvation. And the darkness represents being lost. And so, um... He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. There is none occasion of stumbling in him. And so, uh, this is interesting too. Um, if I, I'm going to continue and read on the next verse, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness has blinded his eyes. So I'm not sure, but I could, I could see, I could guess that sinless perfection people again would look at verse 10. They would say he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. And they would say that none occasion of stumbling means that there's no sinning, that they're sinlessly perfect. They could say that. I don't know if they do, but I could definitely see that being used that way. But then we see, he continues on, and he talks about walking in the darkness, uh, not knowing where they go. And so basically, none occasion of stumbling means that he'd be walking in the light. If he's not, if he's walking in the light, then he's not going to stumble because he sees, you know, where he's going. Um, but it doesn't mean that a person's sinlessly perfect, okay? It's just an analogy, again, for the lightness and for the darkness. Um, and it's interesting, too, verse 11, it says that the darkness, darkness hath blinded his eyes. And uh, it doesn't say that God blinded his eyes, okay? <laughs> Um, so again, there's no Calvinism here, um, and basically, um, person chooses to walk in darkness, um, so let's go to verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake, all sins, past, present, future, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. Now we see him that is from the beginning, and in my expository, I reference to this verse um, from verse 1 in the first chapter. Him that is from the beginning. And in the first chapter, in verse 1, it says that which was that which was from the beginning, or is from the beginning. Um, speaking of, you know, the divine person. Um, I write unto you fathers. So this is interesting too, because he says little children, and then he says fathers. So there could be a contrast between um, you know, like newborn Christians and people who have been in the faith for a while, the fathers of the church or so, I don't know. Because you have known him that is from the beginning, I read unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. Okay. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. You know, or it could just be talking about 
father. Could be talking about fathers, you know, adults, young men, and children. Could be. You know, maybe the context changes. Or, you know, he's basically saying all men, all people. <coughs> ye have overcome the wicked one. Because you have known the Father. And so anybody who's in Christ is forgiven. We have already overcome the wicked one through Christ. It's already been done. I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Those last two sentences in that section there <laughs> pretty interesting. Do not love the world, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I talked about this, how so many people can abuse this and pretty much apply it to anything they want to. They could say, you know, if you watch TV, you love the world. If you listen to secular music, you love the world. You know, if you wear name brand clothing or something, you love the world or whatever. And it's been used and abused. And... Um, but if we go to the context, what's the next thing that it says? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. These are all inward things. It has nothing to do with outward stuff that you enjoy. Um, it's, uh, it's these sinful inward, uh, you know, envying, having pride, and uh, lusting, having a desire for, you know, more, uh, gluttony and, uh, what's it, like, uh, greed, okay, we're talking about stuff like that, okay, the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, and he that doeth the will of God abideth forever, okay, and again, what is the will of God, a lot of people, I can see people taking this different ways when it, when it says this, he that doeth the will, will of God abideth forever. And, you know, again, sinless perfection, people could use this, say that you always have to be doing the will of God, um, you always have to be following the commandments and sinlessly perfect again. You know, obviously the will of God, for one, is to believe in Jesus Christ. That's, you know, the main thing, you know. And, um, but also to love others, to love God, and so it's not like setting up requirements for, like, commandments that you have to follow to be saved or to stay, stay saved. Uh, warning concerning Antichrist. Little children, it is the last time, and you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Okay. And so basically, this is the only verse that I think that where Antichrist is mentioned. We have Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And... So if you know anything about me, you know that I'm not a futurist, and I don't believe a lot of the interpretations of the Antichrist. Um, it says now there are many Antichrists, even back in John's day when he was writing this. And uh, so what does it mean that the Antichrist shall come? It says that Antichrist shall come. Um, you know, I'm not sure... Okay, well, we have Antichrist um, further down in chapter 22. Um, and so, again, from this verse, in verse 18, there is... Uh, and, you know, it's interesting, it says it is the last time, because people talk about, you know, the last times are coming, or we're in the last times, but here John says when he was writing this epistle, that it was the last time. Um, wh whatever that means, you've heard that Antichrist shall come. And 
you know, he could just be, and, and a lot of people think that this means like a singular person who is the Antichrist will come, but then he says there are many Antichrists, whereby we know this this is the last time. Um, so he could just mean that there will be Antichrists, even though, you know, the first one's singular, it still doesn't mean that it's um, limited to a singular. Um, it's just a interpretation issue, um, but it's something I want to look into more, but I'm sure that, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of commentaries are futurists, so I don't know, you know what I would agree with. I definitely have to look into it a lot more in depth. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So, we have here that a lot of you know, I was talking about apostasy, people that that were with the church at the time, or whatever, and, you know, there's, they were said to be believers, and then they went on and they denied Jesus later on, or whatever, and they left. Um, it's not speaking about people who lost their salvation, but people who were never really saved. And basically it's saying, you know, the, that's what Antichrist is, somebody who... Uh, denies Jesus is Antichrist but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things speaking of God God's holy um, an unction from the Holy One I don't know if it's speaking of Jesus or the Father either one it would be applicable to um, you know all things we don't know all things in the sense that God does. We're not omniscient, but uh, you know the Spirit reveals to us what we need to know. I've not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth Jesus Christ, he is antichrist. That denieth the Father and the Son. Whoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Again, this is equating the Son on, on the Father's the Father's level. It's proclaiming the deity of Christ. And uh, so Antichrist is singular there again in verse twenty two. But it's not saying, you know, that one person is Antichrist, it's saying that anybody that denies Jesus is Antichrist. Let that therefore abide in you which you have learned from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So again, there's from the beginning. From the beginning when they heard the gospel. Um... And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Um, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. People who are antichrist, who are trying to get you know, um, people to leave. It could be speaking about some Jews who are trying to get the believers back under the law. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not any man teach you. The anointing which you have received and of him abideth in you. That makes me think of uh, Benny Hinn. I'm sure that's a verse that he uses a lot. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie even, as it has hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So it does seem like the anointing is kind of speaking of the Holy Spirit there. Children of God, and now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so I've talked about this verse a lot too, and I think that you know when he shall appear, it's not speaking of 
rapture, but, you know, when Jesus appears to us, when we die, when we go to meet the Lord, and if you're ashamed before the Lord, then you're lost, basically, you're going to go to hell, because there's nobody that should be saved that would be ashamed, because everybody who's saved is forgiven. Um, it says that in this chapter, it says that you've already overcome the evil one. And so then there's the thing of abiding in him and people, you know, again, sinless perfection or people who say that you can lose salvation, people who deny eternal security will say that you must abide in him and uh, you can leave the faith and um, lose your salvation. But basically what we read here is that people who leave the faith were never saved to begin with. So... Um, It's kind of it's an admonition against apostasy but I think that the point is that the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ and um, so if somebody hasn't truly believed in Christ but they say they have or whatever then they're not abiding in him and he's just making it clear that the way to salvation is Jesus Christ okay it's not that you can lose your salvation but it's that if you haven't really truly put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, for your forgiveness of your sins, then you're going to be ashamed because, you know, he's the only way. And he is the judge. So, uh, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Again, it's not a verse to bash people. You know, when you see uh, a believer doing something you don't agree with or something, you know, you don't just bash him with these verses, but uh, this is a trademark of believers that uh, they do righteousness. They have love and forgiveness. And, uh, So, this has went on longer than I thought, but it's pretty good. It's a really good chapter. And um, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Thanks for watching. God bless.